Hey, this is John Linneball from John Linneball Tutoring, and this is AP U.S. History, video 49, Commodore Perry and the Opening of Japan. If you like this video after you've seen it, please like, comment, share, and subscribe, and please check out my website at johnlinneballtutoring.com, and you can even see my testpreparation.locals.com website. All right, let's get on with the show. Expansion to other lands. Opening trade to Japan. So, basically, the development of West Coast port cities, such as San Francisco, led to an interest in trade with Japan because, obviously, you have port cities that are on the Pacific Ocean. You're going to want to send things across the Pacific to Asian countries, such as Japan. The Tokugawa shogunate, shogunate, I'm sorry, from 1600 to 1868 basically isolated Japan except for some limited trade with the Netherlands and China. The shogunate refused to trade with other countries despite other nations' attempts to, in quotes, open Japanese ports using diplomacy and occasionally force, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail in a second. Commodore Perry, bearing a letter from President Millard Fillmore, set sail for Japan in 1852 to 1853, and then again in 1854. Using diplomacy and vague threats, Perry managed to open Japan to U.S. trade. We'll discuss this a little bit more in the next slide. All right, here is Millard Fillmore, the president at the time, and he authorized the Perry Expedition, or the opening of Japan. Again, that was between 1852 and 1854. So, we can see the Wiki Wikipedia entry for Matthew C. Perry. No, not the guy from Friends. Anyway, this describes the Perry Expedition, and I rely on that heavily and paraphrase it for this slide here. So... In 1852, Commodore Perry was assigned a mission by American President Millard Fillmore to force the opening of Japanese ports to American trade by gunpoint <laughs> gunboat diplomacy, which is basically using military strength to intimidate possible trading partners. The idea, it's kind of like an old protection scheme, you know. Hey, nice port you have here. It would be a shame if some warships were to come and damage it, so have I mentioned that I would like to trade with you? Anyway... So, increasing trade between the U.S. and China, as well as the presence of American whalers, who were people seeking whale oil for lamp fuel, soap, and machine oil. So, you can see whale oil in Wikipedia, and they have very detailed things. So, basically, whale oil was kind of what petroleum oil is today, oil that came from, you know, Mineral, dis mineral deposits under the ground. Before that, they used whale oil for a lot of the same things, like running lamps and making soap and machine oil. Um, so, anyway, the whalers were seeking, you know, rights to go and hunt for whales in waters that were near Japan. And also, there were... European nations who were already dominating many of the good places to basically get fuel to, you know, refuel ships with coal in Asia. So all of these things basically made it very necessary from the U.S.'s point of view to go and trade with Japan and open the ports with Japan. Another American demand, that is U.S. demand, was that Japan safely return shipwrecked sailors who were from the U.S. or other foreign countries, since at that time the Japanese practice before the opening of Japan was to execute or imprison shipwrecked sailors. Sounds like a pretty good idea. I'd say that's pretty humanitarian. Anyway, this mission was also driven by the idea of American mass manifest. It was manifest destiny and the desire to impose the benefits of Western civilization and Christianity on what these people from the United States uh, perceived as backward Asian nations. Remember, this was the 1850s. So, Japan was forewarned by the Dutch of Paris voyage, but refused to change its 250-year-old policy of national seclusion. The Japanese hotly debated the best way to meet this possible threat to 
Japan's economic and political sovereignty. Now, this whole thing that they were warned kind of reminds me of something that would happen in the days before the U.S. entered World War II. The U.S. was told, I believe by the Dutch, but might have been by different diplomats, that, hey, you know that the Japanese are going to attack Hawaii, probably at Pearl Harbor. What are you doing about it? You know, they're letting people from the U.S. State Department know, and... Basically, they decided to do nothing, So, which led to Pearl Harbor, and then they really had to change views of it. Oh, wow, Japan really just bombed us. So, goes both ways. Anyway, let's move on. And more about the Perry Expedition, of course, since that's really all this video is about. On November 24th, 1852, Commodore Perry, the commander of the East India Squadron left from Norfolk, Virginia for Japan seeking a Japanese trade treaty. That's what we're talking about, opening trade. He chose the paddle-wheeled steam frigate Mississippi as his flagship and made port calls at Madeira from December 11th to the 15th, St. Helena from January 10th to the 11th, Cape Town from January 24th to February 3rd, Mauritius from February 8th. 18th to the 20th, no, it's 28th, I should say, Ceylon from March 10th to the 15th, Singapore from March 25th to the 29th, and Macau and Hong Kong from April 7th to the 28th. I actually know someone who's from Macau, and she grew up, and people ask where she's from, and she says, I'm from Macau, and they'll be like, you're from a, a cow like Moo, and she had to explain what Macau was. But I digress. Where he met with Samuel Wells Williams, an American-born student of Chinese culture who provided Chinese lang language translations of his official letters and where he rendezvoused with the Plymouth. He then continued to Shanghai from May 4th to the 17th, where he met with the Dutch-born American dipl diplomat, Anton L. C. Portman, who translated his official letters into Dutch and where he rendezvoused with the ship Susquehanna. Perry then switched his flagship from Susquehanna and made a call at Naha on Great Luchu Island, or Ryukyu, which is now called Okinawa, if I'm butchering the pronunciation of these names, I'm sorry, from May 17th to the 26th. Ignoring the claims of Satsuma domain to the islands, he demanded an audience with the Raikyukun King Shotai at Shuri Castle and secured promises that the kingdom was would be opened to U.S. trade. Continuing on to the Ogasa... Ogasawara, Ogasawara Islands in mid-June, Perry met with the local inhabitants and purchased a plot of land. Let's move on. The first visit, 1853. Perry reached Uraga at the entrance to Edo Bay in Japan on July 8, 1853. His actions at this critical point were informed by a, clear, a careful study of Japan's previous encounters with Western ships and knowledge of the Japanese hierarchical culture. During his arrival, Perry ordered his ships to steam past Japanese lines toward the capital of Edo and turn their guns to the town of Uraga. Perry refused Japanese demands to leave or proceed to Nagasaki, the only Japanese port that was open to foreigners at that time. Perry attempted to intimidate the Japanese by presenting them with a white flag, get it, surrender, and a letter which told them that in the case they chose to fight, that is, if they decided to fight, the Americans would destroy them. He also fired blank shots from his 73 cannon, which he claimed was in celebration of the American Independence Day. Well, it was a little past July 4th since they got into the bay on July 8th, 1853. But anyway, so Perry's ships were equipped with 
new, I don't know how to pronounce this word, Paxons, Pisons, I don't know. If you know how, hey, let me know in the in the comments. Shell guns. They were cannons capable of wreaking great explosive destruction with every shell. He also ordered his shipboats to commence survey operations of the coastline and surrounding waters over the objections of local Japanese officials. Perry did, however, bring gifts to Japan. Perry received permission to take government stores, you know, that is, things that came from the U.S. government, as gifts for the natives, especially obsolete small arms. The, these included 40 M1, you know, M1819 Hall rifles with 4,000 cartridges, 20 percussion pistols with 2,000 cartridges and 20 artillery swords and 20 muskets with Maynard percussion locks and 40 light cavalry sabers as well as 100 Colt revolvers. And this I got from right here, the HTTPS Wikipedia forward slash wiki forward slash Perry Expedition. So it's right da, 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 right here, what I've highlighted. That's where that came from. All right, back, back to this. Da, da, da. Okay, here we go. Ah, you can see that I use Tunnel Bear. Anyway, meanwhile, the Shogun Tokugawa Aisha, Ai, Aiyoshi, okay, Tokugawa Ayoshi was ill and incapacitated, making it difficult for the Japanese government to decide how to handle a U.S. Navy, uh, well, the U.S. Navy's unprecedented threat to Japan's capital city. So on July 11th, Roju Abe Masahiro simply waited, deciding that simply accepting a letter from the Americans would not constitute a violation of Japanese sovereignty. The decision was conveyed to Uraga, and Perry was asked to move his fleet slightly southwest to the beach at Kurihama, where he was allowed to land on July 14th, 1853. After presenting the letter to attending delegates, Perry departed for Hong Kong, promising to return the following year for the Japanese reply. Now, let's look at the officers of the Perry expedition. To command his fleet, Perry chose officers with whom he had served in the Mexican-American War. Commander Franklin Buchanan was captain of the flight, of, not the flight, the ship Susquehanna, and Joel Abbott, Perry's second in command, was captain of the Macedonian. Commander Henry A. Adams was chief in staff with the title captain of the fleet, and Major Jacob Zylin was someone who would later become the commandant of the United States Marine Corps, and he was the ranking Marine officer and was stationed on the Mississippi. Perry returned on the 13th of February, 1854, after only six months, rather than after the full year promised, and with 10 ships and 1,600 men. So, both of these actions that I've described were intended to increase the pressure on the Japanese. You know, firing the guns, presenting these weapons, presenting the uh, very subtle white surrender flag and letter from Millard Fillmore, etc. Anyway, these were obviously intended to pressure the Japanese, and after initial resistance, Perry was permitted to land at Kanagawa near the present-day site of Yokohama on March 8, 1854, and then the Convention of Kanagawa was signed on March 31st. Perry signed as the American plenipotentiary, and Hayashi Akira, also known by his title as Daigaku no Kami, signed for the Japanese side. Perry departed, mistakenly believing that the agreement had been made with imperial representatives, 
but he didn't understand the true position of the shogun, the then de facto ruler of Japan, was the important person, and that wasn't who he had met with or who we had made this agreement with. Anyway, Perry then visited Hakodate on the northern island of Hokkaido and Shimoda, the two ports which the treaty stipulated would be opened by visits or opened by this treaty to visits by American ships. The second visit in 1854, on his way back to Japan, Perry anchored off Keelung in Formosa, which is now called Taiwan, for 10 days. Perry and his crew members li- landed on Formosa and investigated the potential of mining for coal deposits in that area. He also emphasized in his reports that Formosa provided a convenient midway trade location. And he also noted that the island was very defensible, so once they had control of it, it'd be hard for another navy to come and take it over. And so for that reason, it could serve as a base for exploration in a similar way that Cuba had used, done, etc. for the Spanish in the Americas. So kind of what Cuba was as a Spanish base in the Americas. Formosa could be an American base in the Far East. Occupying Formosa could help the United States counter the European monopolization of major trade routes. The U.S. government also failed to respond to Perry's proposal to claim sovereignty over Formosa. I guess they said, eh, I don't know, that's kind of far away. We're going to have to send an awful lot of ships, etc., over there to take over this island in the Far East. So they're just like, eh, maybe not. Anyway, let's move on. So, eventually, uh, Perry returned to the United States in 1855, and Congress granted Perry a reward of $20,000, which, according to one article on Wikipedia, that'd be worth about $556,000 in 2022 dollars. But we do have this other thing here, where they say, okay, the $20,000 was roughly $737,000 in 2022. So we have a little bit of a discrepancy here, depending on uh, which Wikipedia article you trust. Either way, it, it's a lot of money, okay? I mean, basically, that's the whole point, is it's, you know, $20,000 in 1855 dollars was is worth a lot more than... The, you know, $20,000 in 2022 dollars would be worth, you know. So, anyway. And Perry used some of this money to write and publish a report of the expedition in three volumes, which was titled Narrative of the Expeditions of an American Squadron to the Chinese Seas and Japan. As his health began to fail, he was promoted to rear admiral on the retired list as a reward for his work in the, in the Far East. Perry's declining years. Living in New York City, Perry's health began to fail, and yes, that is a little bit of a misplaced modif- modification. I'm sorry, misplaced modifier that, okay, was... Perry's health living in New York City? No, Perry was living in New York City. So anyway, for you grammar dorks out there, yes, that is right. And I am a big grammar dork sometimes. So anyway, had to point that out to you that, yes, Perry was living in New York City, not his health, as this might imply. Ha ha ha. Anyway, Perry's health began to fail as he suffered from cirrhosis of the liver from heavy drinking. That's usually what people think of when they hear cirrhosis of the liver. They say, oh, this guy was a big-time drinker, huh? Yes, he was. Perry was an alcoholic, which worsened his health problems, leading to his death. He also had severe arthritis that left him in frequent pain and occasionally kept him from working. He was in so much pain from the arthritis, he couldn't work sometimes. 
Perry spent his last years preparing for the publication of his story of the Japan expedition, announcing its completion on December 28, 1857. And two days later, he was removed from his last post, which was an assignment to the Naval Efficiency Board. He died as he was awaiting further orders from, you know, on, well, from the Navy, on March 4th, 1858, in New York City. He died of rheumatic fever, which had spread to his heart, which, of course, was exacerbated by his gout and alcoholism. Initially interred in a vault on the grounds of St. Mark's Church in the Bowery in New York City, Perry's remains were moved to the Island Cemetery in Newport, Rhode Island on March 21st, 1866, along with those of his daughter, Anna, who died in 1839. In 1873, an elaborate monument was placed by Perry's widow over his grave in Newport. And finally, the Perry Expedition, or the opening of Japan, 1852 to 1854. This ends way after 1854. What we're showing here is the surrender of the Japanese to U.S. and allied allied troops in 1945. The U.S. military flew Commodore Perry's flag in the upper left corner, so this here which had been taken from Annapolis, the U.S. Naval Academy, to Tokyo to be displayed at the surrender ceremonies, which officially ended World War II. Did you find this video useful? If you did, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. You might also want to click on the little bell, picture, icon, whatever you want to call it. That will make sure that you're notified. Why? Well, it's really simple because, one, they're great videos and they're fun to watch, but two, YouTube doesn't share any ad revenue with me unless I have a thousand subscribers, which I do. Thanks to everybody who's subscribed for that. And 4,000 hours of watch time within the last year, which I don't have. So I don't have that time. You can help me out, but I do have the subscribers, so yay! And why would you want to do that? Well, one, ad money will help me make more videos. The more money I have, the easier it is for me to pay my bills, the more time I have to do things like this. And getting back to the whole advertisement issue, if you saw an ad during this video, please know I did not get any of the ad money from that ad, and I won't get any ad money until I have the subscriptions that, the subscribers I should say, which I do have, and the time that YouTube demands. For the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put in playlists, etc. I gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I really do want your feedback. I really do want to hear any criticism you make in good faith. What do I mean by good faith? Well, what I mean is don't be a troller and don't be a spammer. I don't want to advertise your product. I don't want, you know, if you want to call me naughty names, okay, great, but don't do it on my videos and don't do it in my comments. So I reserve the right to delete comments that I decide are troll posts or spam. On a more positive note, you can hire me. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I can visit you in person in the San Francisco Bay Area. I frequently travel to other places such as Southern California or New York State or sometimes even Australia and New Zealand. So you can hire me. You can, of course, hire me from anywhere in the world if you have internet access, which you do, because otherwise, how are you watching this? Anyway, so if you want to work with me in person or over the internet, let me know. We can work something out. Thanks for watching, and there's a little more information. If you want my contact information, etc., you can continue watching. Otherwise, have a good day. Wow, you decided to continue watching. Okay, great. Contact me. 
You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Tutoring. Instagram.com forward slash John dot Linnaball dot tutoring. Phone number 415-623-4251. That's my cell phone. You can text me. You can call me. If I don't pick up, I'll call you back. And if you texted me, I'll text you back. Email john at johnlinnaball.com. Website johnlinnaball.com or johnlinnaballtutoring.com. Doesn't matter which one you pick. Both of them will take you to the same website. Testpreparation.locals.com. That's a different website. You can see videos and things like that on there. And testpreparation.locals.com. You know, that's also something you can look at. And I just said that, didn't I? Oh, well, repeated myself. Uh, Well, sue me if you don't like it. Anyway... (laughs) lbry.tv at johnlinnaball.tutoring well johnlinnaball.tutoring no dot anyway that's another thing you can look up and it has a lot of the same videos these all have a lot of the same videos that are on YouTube but you might like those formats a little bit better it's up to you and if you want to send me some mail package whatever John Linnaball tutoring at 1859 Powell Street number 109 san francisco california 94133 that's my mailing address and just one second here all right so this video is based on the baron's ap u.s history book it's a review book i mostly use the fourth edition i do have the fifth edition but i didn't use it for this one anyway also any other sources listed in the video description and this particular one mostly wikipedia as well as my general knowledge of u.s history and just my general knowledge while this should help you do well on the ap u.s history exam i cannot be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests homework etc so please read your class texts and please pay attention to what your teacher says in class and on that note i'm out of here have a nice day please like subscribe share and contact me if you have any questions all right bye